Hello, everyone. I'm Shasha from Spanogo, and I would like to thank you for joining us the webinar, How to Prevent Cybersecurity Breaches Through Security Assurance. Your host today will be Anupam Sahai. Anupam has over 15 years of experience in the security space. Before we start with Anupam's slides, I just want to share a few uh, housewarming rules. This webinar will be 30 minutes long. After Anupam's talk, uh, there will be time for Q&A. You see at the bottom of uh, your screen a Q&A button, so feel free to send your questions during the webinar. This webinar will be also recording and you'll, be, you'll also receive a link to review it after the webinar. Thanks again for joining and uh, we'll just start now with Anupam's slides. Anupam, your turn. Thank you, Sasha. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> my, my name is Anupam Sahai. I've been in the security industry for about 15 years in different leadership roles. And uh, I've worked uh, in, in the areas of cybersecurity, hybrid, hybrid cloud services, risk and GRC, and, and um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And uh, let's get started. So this is the overview of the topics that we will cover today. Uh, we will st start by talking about data breaches. Why do they happen? And, and what are the attack patterns that we can discern from, from these different breaches? And then we'll jump, jump into security assurance. This is an important uh, topic that a lot of security and risk practitioners are, are uh, talking about. So, so we will define what security assurance means and how to go about achieving security assurance through best practices and learnings. And then I'll spend some time talking about what are the, ch what are the challenges that existing solutions have and, and talk about Spanigo, which is an automated tool for cybersecurity assurance for the hybrid cloud. And then as Sasha said, we will open it up for Q&A so that, uh, and by the way, feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A section of the tool, and we will collect all the questions and answer them at the end of the day, at the end of the, near the end of the webinar. And I also have a number of references that you can use to get detailed, uh, detailed view of the topics that I would, I would be covering today. I just want to let you guys know that this is a very broad topic, and, um, the idea of the session today is to give you a, a overall picture of the landscape and uh, give you some best practices that you can take away and start leveraging in your organization. And in the subsequent webinars that, that we will have, we will drill down into each one of these aspects in, in a lot more detail. So the references will help you with, uh, with uh, getting all the information that, that you may need. So let's get started. So, in terms of the largest data breaches, uh, let me show you some of the data breaches that, uh, okay, I need to share my screen. So I clicked on that hyperlink. Now there's an internet site which shows you the latest set of breaches that are happening. And, uh, and so this is the website that you'll find in the, in the presentation slides if you're interested. And it shows you in real time what are the different breaches that have happened out there. And uh, the color coding is really indicating the sensitivity of the data. So higher the sensitivity of the data, it's more leaning towards red. And low sensitivity means uh, it's not as important, but it's still a breach. And you can see here, uh, you've got the Capital One breach, uh, which happened in July 2019 where um, a lot of Capital One account holder names were, were lost. Then you have the Facebook breach that happened in uh, September 2019, which is recently. Um, and, and you can see that these breaches are rampant. It's not a one-off thing. And, and the site will show you over the years what are the different breaches that have happened. And it's a good visual way of understanding the sense of the problem that we are faced with. And, and um, just to put this in perspective, just in 2019, 
there have been 4,000 data, breach, data breaches that have exposed 4 billion records. And, and think of a record as a, you know, a information that's to be protected, whether it's personal information or credit card information. Now, these data breaches are very, very expensive. And uh, some of the monetary costs that you see here are, are staggering. And especially if you look at the US specific costs, you're talking about an average cost of 8 million. And um, the highest uh, cost on a per vertical basis is in healthcare, which is about 6.45 million. And, and, uh, and the other worrying thing is that the time it takes to identify and contain a breach is roughly 279 days, which is close to a year. So while hackers takes minutes and seconds to steal the data, the average time it takes to discover and recover and contain a breach is close to a year. So, so there's an inherent asymmetry in terms of how long it takes for, for companies to be able to detect and fix the breach, breaches. Now, what is not included that happens as a result of a data breach is there's brand damage and loss of credibility. So if, if my uh, healthcare provider gets breached, then I, I'm a little uh, careful about sharing information and I might switch uh, healthcare providers, for example. There are also government fines. For example, in HIPAA, if you get uh, breached, the government will fine you for about $1.5 million uh, and more. And similarly, if you're PCI compliant, then the credit card companies might prevent your transactions from taking place at all. So there are lots of uh, non-monetary credibility and, and fine related uh, challenges that arise because of these data breaches. So let's try to understand how are these breaches happening? We, we established that breaches are rampant. It's very expensive to, to, uh, to manage that breach. And let's try to get get to the next level of detail to understand what is causing these breaches. So the motivation behind these breaches are driven by two primary concerns. One is for financial benefits and the other is espionage. And the espionage is uh, state-driven actors that are motivated to steal intellectual property or, or confidential information. And the financial, financial motivation is really around stealing personal information whether it's credit cards, whether it's uh, health records, so that you can leverage it and, and misuse it to, uh, to take advantage of it. And there is an underground marketplace, similar to an Amazon underground marketplace, where you can trade these personal records that, that for a fee. And, and typically the cost that you can um, charge uh, for a personal record ranges from $150 to about $450 for a healthcare record. So, so these are real, real transactions that are happening in an underground market. So in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, what causes these security breaches? A lot of these are because of hacking. Uh, some of them are due to social attacks like phishing. It could be because of malware. And, and typically, as I said, they're perpetrated by, finan sorry, financial and espionage motives and they're perpetrated by outsiders who are trying to steal your information. And I'll, as I go along, I'll show you uh, a bit more detail around what are the typical attack patterns. So, so if you analyze all the breaches that happen over a period of time, and this is over five to six year period, you'll see that there are 10 types of attack patterns which are shown here. Um, privilege misuse, denial of service, crimeware, lost and stolen assets, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So these are ten different attack patterns that keep on repeating, time and again, and and they can be classified under these different uh, categories, and and these attack patterns are important to understand so that you can then combat it effectively in terms of a of a way to mitigating and preventing such breaches from happening. So let's, now that we know what are the attack patterns, so why, why do they happen? Let's keep asking the, the why question and try to get to the root of the matter. So at the end of the day, organizations are getting breached 
for, for a variety of reasons, maybe misconceptions and, and lack of preparedness. And what, uh, what I'm going to talk about are, are really some of, some of those issues that cause, cause some of these breaches. So one, one primary reason is that, you know, with the cloud vendors, they have this shared responsibility model. And in the on-prem world, in the on-premises world, everything was the responsibility from, from physical security to data protection was the responsibility of the on-premises uh, vendor or the company. But in a cloud world, the shared responsib responsibility model, which AWS and Azure and, and GCP, uh, which are the three primary cloud vendors, they do partial protection of the data. And that causes confusion in the minds of a lot of companies that I've talked to, where they somehow assume that by moving to the cloud, they're gonna be protected by the cloud provider. And as you can see here, that because of the shared responsibility model, whether you are deploying on the infrastructure as a service, which means that you're buying virtual machines and, um, and a hosting infrastructure, to a platform as a service or software as a service, your responsibility as a customer can vary from protecting everything above the network to protecting um, the endpoints and the data, uh, data elements that you store on it. So this is a source of huge confusion and, and there is a responsibility that as a customer who's using or uh, deploying a hybrid cloud or a multi-cloud environment, you need to be aware of. The other challenge is that there is no guidance on which frameworks to use. And there are about tens of frameworks. Uh, these are control frameworks that could potentially be used to create an effective information security program. So how do you know which one to use? And um, secondly, another big misconception is that, you know, hey, I'm compliant, so hence I'm going to be secure. Absolutely wrong. Compliance does not include equal security. And, and the reason I say this is because compliance is really focused around pr protecting a, a single strategic asset. So for example, PCI is protecting credit card information. HIPAA is protecting uh, the healthcare information. Now, if, if I'm at a company interested in protecting all of my critical data assets, then having compliance programs only gets me partially there. And so there's a need to have a broader information security program that will allow me to, to get visibility and manage my, all my critical assets, not just my credit card information or healthcare information. So this is a, a common myth that, uh, that needs to be understood and addressed. And finally, the people and governance related. One of the biggest reasons why the security programs fail is because there's lack of appreciation and support from, from top management around the need to do this. Uh, thankfully, some of this is going away because of the rampant breaches that are happening and taking place on a daily basis. So let's, let's uh, dive into uh, understanding, you know, what are the core reasons why some of these issues are taking place? So we're kind of drilling down further and further to get to the root of the problem. And then we'll talk about some of the best practices that we can employ as a company to address some of these big concerns that we, have, that, that we have. So if you look at the biggest reasons why some of these security threats and breaches are happening, uh, this, is, this is prioritized based on the top eight, sorry, nine issues. So misconfiguration of the cloud platform which could be because of incorrect setup is the highest contributor followed by unauthorized access, which is 55%, followed by insecure interfaces, hijacking of accounts, sharing of data, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the common causes and the percentage contributors to the key threats that companies and enterprises face today. And as you can see here, misconfiguration and unauthorized access are the top two biggest threats. And this is also borne out, borne out by the market feedback where IDG, for example, um, say, uh, has, a, has a report which says that nine out of 10 concerns are due to misconfiguration, 
and um, and due to lack of monitoring. And and similarly, Gartner has uh, has a report which says eighty percent of the cloud breaches are due to one of the three things: customer misconfiguration, uh, mismanaged credentials, and insider theft. And uh, so these are active challenges and uh, issues that keep coming up. So now let's talk about given all the root causes of the concerns and the challenges and, and the enormity of the task and the breaches that are happening, what can we do about it? So let's define cybersecurity assurance. And because we're gonna talk about how to address all these breach related issues and uh, provide quote unquote assurance that protects you against these breaches and prevents you from being hacked and, and protects you thereby. So assurance is a, is a stronger word than uh, let's say confidence or protection because you are essentially, and this is an ISO definition, um, TR15443 is the is ISO report which defines all the terminologies. And so assurance is really evidence-driven confidence that you can provide to the company that you're meeting or exceeding your security objectives. And uh, how do we do that? So first thing is to understand what is, the, what is the tolerance level for a company to, to meet the cyber posture requirements. And, and there is an SLA, the service level agreement, that the security program needs to meet. Now, every company may have their own cyber posture requirements, and no company can, can achieve, I, I, I would say, it's very hard to achieve 100% security. And you'll see why I'm saying that, because there's always a trade-off between the, the degree of risk exposure that you have and the resources that are required to make it happen. So every company has to decide what is the risk tolerance level that they have, what's the posture, posture capabilities that they would like to achieve, and, and that's a function of the resources, the risk profile that they want to achieve and can, can tolerate. And secondly, then once you know what your risk tolerance level is as a company, you put together a set of, set of cybersecurity policies that will be effective and meet or exceed your SLA requirements. And, um, and I'll talk about what those policies ought to be, or at least the top, top six issues that you as a company should take into account when implementing a cybersecurity assurance program. And so once you've established it, then there is a need to continuously meet or exceed under all circumstances using whatever methods that you're disposable at your disposal to ensure that there's no deviation. So typically what happens is that you do audits once a year or once a quarter, and in between audits, your posture might be compromised, might go below the red line, which is what your corporate SLA design requirements are. And um, so, so that's not acceptable. In a security assurance world, you're talking about continuously monitoring your cyber posture or your SLA to ensure that you're always meeting and exceeding continuously throughout the year. Because if you have a dip in your assurance levels, uh, that's the perfect time for the hackers to come in and steal the data. And as I said earlier, it takes seconds and minutes to, uh, for the cyber, cyber attackers to steal the data, and it takes about a year to detect and respond to it. So you don't want to have a window of opportunity for the attackers to come in and compromise your critical assets. So having understanding that SLA, corporate SLA, and then putting together an information security program to meet or exceed that requirements is key. So let's, let's take our understanding of what does it mean to provide cybersecurity assurance. And, and uh, again, from a big picture point of view, there are three primary questions that as a company that you are asking. One is that you're trying to understand, as a company, what are the critical assets that I need to protect? And this is, this, is, uh, this is not everything that you have in the company. 
There might be some critical assets. It could be intellectual property. It could be a quarterly earnings. It could be your source code that you're trying to protect. So you can identify a list of critical assets that are a subset of all the IT assets that, that you might have. Um, IT or data uh, assets could be, could be part of it. The second thing is to understand what are the threats that could lead to compromise of these critical assets. And, um, and that's another thing that needs to be understood. And finally, the third question is, are you, do you have the ability to detect and respond before the data is compromised? Because once it's compromised, it's too late. And, and so essentially what, what you're looking at is trying to answer these three questions. So any security program is trying to answer these, answer these three questions. And, uh, and you're trying to figure out how likely is this particular threat going to be affecting my critical assets and uh, what's the likelihood that might happen with what potential impact. So I'll give you an example. For example, if you have a, a low probability threat like an earthquake happening on the West Coast, that's a low likelihood but very high impact uh, uh, potential which could affect your risk, uh, your um, IT operations, your company operations. Um, and uh, so there are different scenarios, risk scenarios that you need to be able to uh, dream up based on your requirements. And um, all of this is really putting together a framework which is really around managing your cyber risk exposure. And the cyber risk exposure could be because of uh, people issues, it could be because of technology issues. And, um, and since there's nothing called an absolute security, as I said earlier, there is a trade-off between how much this exposure do you want to have and uh, that you can tolerate and, and how much um, resources that you need to, to plug all the holes or some of the holes. So the first thing, so another way to look at what, what, what I'm saying is that there is a need to understand and quantify your company's risk exposure. And the reason you want to do that is, is you're essentially looking at all your critical assets, the threats that are affected, and the weaknesses that could be exploited by these threats. And really, that leads to the risk if you take into account the likelihood impact. And the need for a risk assessment is, is fundamental to understanding where do you stand today and where do you want to go uh, so that you can, you can be assured that your risk posture, your assurance posture is indeed uh, measured and maintained. And most of the regulations do have that built into the requirements like HIPAA, PCI, FISMA, any information security program will have that as a fundamental requirement. So, so let's, let's dive into deeper a little bit about how do you establish your desired posture. The first step is to, for companies to know what is their risk tolerance level and how are they able to uh, establish that because that needs a little bit of um, uh, understanding of where do you stand today. So the first thing is to understand what are the critical assets, pick a framework and I'll show you some example framework that you can, that you can use and do a risk assessment to, to get a lay of the land to see how much risk exposure do you have today? And, and then based on what you understand, the next thing is to pick and make and create a target risk profile that is suitable for your company. And, and then you repeat this process of fixing the problems and, and doing the assessment in a repeated fashion. And here are some example control frameworks that you can use. As you move from left to right, the, the control frame, frameworks uh, on the left-hand side are a lot more loosely defined from a security and risk perspective. And as you move to the right, they become more and more definitive and more, um, you know, deal with higher security level issues. So you could pick one or many of these frameworks to do a risk assessment and to, uh, to understand what's your target cyber posture 
that you would like to achieve. And then once you do that, then you're able to maintain it going forward. Another key concept is that uh, any information security program needs to have a multi-stage approach. And, and the reason is because there is no perfect security solution. That's a myth. And, uh, and so there is a need to have a multi-level, multi-stage security program. And uh, this, this uh, let me spend a few minutes talking about this. So any information security program has two dimensions to it. There is a dimension around what kind of controls or protections are being put in place. Uh, so there are a set of administrative controls which are related to policy, governance, related issues where everybody in the company needs to follow certain guidelines. There are a set of technical controls that pertain to protecting the IT assets that can be automated. And then there are physical controls that are related to physically protecting and securing the assets. So if you think about the, the house example, if, you're, if you think about your house as an example, uh, if you have to protect your house, you need to have locks and windows. You also need to have um, monitoring like surveillance equipment, like alarm monitoring, heat sensors, and motion detectors to, to make sure that if somebody breaks into the locks and windows, you have some um, motion detection and, and uh, ability to understand that there has been a breach. And finally, once you know that there has been a breach, there's a need to respond to it either by calling 911 or having a dog that would uh, take care of the attacker. So the reason we have this multi-stage approach for the physical aspect of security is because there is no one means that could guarantee absolute security. And hence, there is a need to have this multi-stage approach. Similarly, if you look at technical, technical um, controls, there are different types of protections that you can do. And uh, Again, they fall in the protection, detection, response categories. Uh, this, is, uh, this has also been made available in, uh, in different uh, control frameworks here. I'm taking uh, an example of a NIST cybersecurity framework. They define five different stages. I'm abstracting them out to three different frameworks, but it captures the value uh, in any case. And so, on the technical side and the administrative control side, you see all these different uh, capabilities that as a company you need to have so that you're able to protect your assets and then detect if there's any policy violations or any violations of any of these uh, basic posture capabilities. And then there needs to be a call to action to fix any open issues that are found through remediation, through incident management, or through SIM. On the policy side, which is the administrative bucket or the governance bucket, uh, there are a number of things that need to be done, which I mentioned earlier around um, understanding what, what are the assets that need to be protected, what's the cyber posture policy, and doing risk assessments to get a holistic view of your overall capabilities. So again, the key takeaway message here is that there needs to be a, a multi-stage approach to putting together an information security program, and they should cater to different parts of, of the solution, uh, which, um, which could be related to administrative, technical, and physical safeguards. And uh, that's the only way uh, a secure program can be, can be run. So what does this all mean? Let's, let's translate that into best practices that can, can be taken away or can, we can take away as a result of all of this. So, so the first thing is get your foundations right. And it's like uh, you're trying to get a car built which has the basic uh, structure, the speed, the, the steering wheel, and the right engine in place, which means dealing with the security configuration issues, having a robust IM policy so the right people can access the right resources, and then dealing with vulnerability management issues. That's like table stakes. The second thing is to automate the whole security compliance processes by picking a control framework. And I gave an example of a list of control frameworks that, that you could use depending on how uh, mature an organization you want to be. And you can, of course, pick one or many of these frameworks as you go along. This, 
the concept of multi-stage security is, is very key to be successful. Just having a firewall or just having um, an intrusion detection system is not sufficient. It, it needs to go beyond uh, monitoring and remediation. So monitoring and remediation is key, but you should also go about protection and enforcement of all the security policies in an automated fashion in this multi-stage security. Dealing with threat intelligence is very key. Without threat intel, all your security mechanisms may be looking at static information. Threat intel is the one that adds the dynamic nature for any future attacks. And so taking that into account is very key. And finally, having a secure deployment architecture is very key, which means having a two-factor authentication, having micro-segmentation, and then IAM controls to lock down your perimeter. Perimeter here could be hybrid cloud environments that could span on-prem and, uh, and multi-cloud environments. So these are the takeaways in terms of the basic building blocks that you would need to have a robust cybersecurity assurance program, which, which is realizable by companies. And of course, this is customized to a particular company based on a number of factors here, based on what control frameworks they choose, what's their risk tolerance level, and the cyber posture that they would like to achieve. So let's talk about how do we do this? This seems like a whole bunch of issues and many, many different threat actors, threat vectors, uh, multiple stages of security. And, and so how do we get around, get our arms around solving the problem given those six best practices that I talked about? And you can go beyond the six, uh, which are essentially the table stakes that I, that I mentioned here. So the challenge that exists today is that there are siloed solutions that look at the, look at the problem in a piecemeal manner. And, and you can see here why that a lot of the on-prem tools don't work in the cloud. Uh, so you need to have two or three different tools, one looking at maybe on-premises only, another one looking at just the cloud. And there are um, cloud vendors that give you AWS only or Azure only solutions. But as a company, I'm looking for a unified way of looking at my entire hybrid cloud infrastructure that gives me a complete understanding of visibility of where I stand and also should, should allow me to get, get a complete manageability of my security and compliance posture. That is the challenge that exists today. And, uh, and things are getting worse. There are, there are a lot of changes that are happening and I call it the three Vs, the variety, volume, and the velocity of change. Variety as in you have the cloud vendors, you have on-prem virtual on-prem and then virtualizations. There's containers coming in, coming in, which adds to the transient nature of computing. Uh, then you have serverless computing, which is even more transient. The average life of a container is about seven days. Average life of a serverless function is, is a few hours. So in this dynamically changing environment where you have a huge volume of servers being spun up and down, functions being spun up and down, and uh, how do we deal with the security problem to make sure that we are not inundated with, uh, with challenges and, and, and address it? So having this unified view of looking at things becomes very, very important in this dynamic world. So now let me talk about, um, given all the needs and challenges, let me talk about an automated solution that addresses all the challenges that you would face to deal with um, cybersecurity assurance in a hybrid cloud environment. So I, I mentioned that today's solutions are siloed. So Spanigo gives you a, a unified single pane of glass view for your entire security and compliance and risk posture. And it does that by discovering all the resources and assets that you may have on multi-cloud environments, on, on premises, uh, network elements, applications, what have you. It will discover them, give you visibility, and give you a complete uh, posture assessment for, for your hybrid cloud environment. It also automates your configuration checks, gives you security best practices, and also you have out-of-the-box availability 
of regulatory compliance support. HIPAA, PCI, NIST, GDPR, ISO <coughs> are included as part of that. Uh, it gives you con continuous audit assurance, which means that you are able to monitor and understand where you stand and, and able to get remediation guidance. And it's very easy to deploy and manage the whole end-to-end um, -end infrastructure. This is the automation cycle, and I won't go into it too, too much detail, but suffice it to say, it has a multi-stage uh, automation cycle where it discovers the assets, it assesses based on your set of control requirements, gives you remediation guidance, and then you have the ability to do monitoring and drift analysis to fix any issues that, that might come up, and thereby you have, in real time, the ability to continuously manage your cybersecurity posture and, and thereby assure your cybersecurity uh, posture-related requirements. I'm not going to show you a demo, but I'm going to show you a few screenshots that give you a feel for it before I open it up for Q&A. So this is an example of um, the dashboard that you see. Um, you know, it, it shows you the number of assets that you, asset groups that you have or the schemas that you have in your hybrid cloud infrastructure. Uh, they're built in control frameworks. You can see there are 33 control frameworks or templates available. And these control frameworks could be um, NIST, ISO, HIPAA, PCI, AWS specific checks. And, and you can create your own tailored or customized policies or control frameworks as per your enterprise requirements. Um, there's also a, a section which shows you all the validations or assessments that have been done so far, and you can do assessments on demand or on a scheduled basis. It gives you a trend line so that you know where do you stand, how things are changing, and, and um, the idea here is to give you complete visibility in a single pane of glass for your entire hybrid cloud infrastructure. You can dig deeper and understand you know, where the problems are, do root cause analysis. So here, for example, for this particular assessment that I did, this is for the AWS infrastructure. There are 14 uh, fail failures. Three of them are critical issues. You can click on, uh, on any of these and get to the, the specific critical issues that are failing and the resources that are causing it so that you can then create an action plan by pushing this to JIRA or, or, or um, ServiceNow, et cetera. That, uh, that, that will allow you to create a project around it and prioritize it. You can also do drift analysis, which means that if there are changes in the posture that happens along the way, you have uh, complete visibility into all the assessments that happened in the past. All of them are checkpointed, and then you can go back and look at where things changed. Maybe a new asset came in, maybe a, a policy failure happened, so you have complete visibility and thereby you, you can take action to fix those issues. And finally, I wanna show you some example reports. It gives you a complete um, high level overview and then you can operationalize it by getting to the root cause of the issue. So, so this is a report which tells you, you know, what is the high level pass or failure that happened in terms of the policy checks, how many were critical, and uh, what percentage passed or failed. Uh, you can keep drilling down. This is showing you every policy that was assessed, what was the overall status, how many IT resources passed or failed, and then you can, you can keep drilling down where you can look at every control and, and get, to the, uh, get, to the inform get to the details about uh, what, was the, what was the control status, how many resources failed, and then we will also give you the remediation guidance. So I just wanted to give you a quick um, overview of Span you Go and how it works and helps achieve the, the cybersecurity assurance goals. Let me pause here and see whether there are any questions. Okay. Thank you, An Anupam. This was an insightful talk. Any questions, guys? Oh. There's one question that's coming and asking about the why the need for a multi-state security. Yeah, this is, this is a, 
this is a great question and something that I would like to emphasize again, uh, because there is no single mechanism for foolproof security, uh, having a multi-stage security allows you to uh, provide some semblance of a foolproof security uh, because hacker, one has to assume that hackers are always on the prowl and always trying to find uh, loopholes and, and thereby having a multi-tier defense is always better than a single tier of defense. And all the robust information security programs, I mentioned this cybersecurity framework, I mentioned ISO, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they recommend having a multi-tier approach for increasing robustness and, and also to contain the, the potential of a breach. Okay, thank you, Anupam. Uh, there's another question asking about how do you price the solution, Sanova? Okay, so um, the pricing of the solution, uh, I assume you mean span you go. Yeah, so it's, it's basically a function of the number of uh, assets or, or resources that are discovered and managed by, uh, by, uh, by Spanigo, and also the number of policies that is used to check, uh, uh, to, to, to check uh, and, and manage your infrastructure. So it's a function of the number of resources and the number of policies that, that you're managing using Spanigo. Okay, thanks Anupam. Another question from Prakash. Uh, what is your opinion on using biometrics to control access so that the surface of the attack is secured? Okay, great question. So when you say biometric, I, I assume you mean for authentication. So yes, um, as I mentioned earlier, using a two-factor authentication is, is the key tenet for any robust security program. And one of the factors uh, could be biometrics, it could be a, a text message, or could be a secure key approach. But having a two-factor authentication is pretty much a bottom line for any robust security program. So absolutely uh, is, is, a, is a good way of going about it. Thank you, Anupam. Another question from Das asking, how long does it take for Spanago to help with newer standards? Oh, that's a great question. So we have a, a, a group of content experts that are able to generate a new regulation very, very quickly. Um, so it's a matter of weeks that we are able to generate a new control framework. Now, more importantly, the tool has the capability, the platform has the capability where you can create your own controls as well and create your own custom control frameworks which allows you to group certain controls that exist today. So you have multi-level multi, multi -level capabilities, both in the platform and, and, and from the San Diego team to work with you to, to create any, uh, any custom control frameworks that you may need. Perfect, thank you Anupam. And I believe this is the last question. It's, uh, what is the challenge with Silent Solutions? Oh, challenge uh, with, okay. Uh, the challenge with the siloed solutions is that you're looking at a piecemeal of the uh, piecemeal information and and to get a single concrete uh, understanding of the challenges is nearly impossible so if you have one tool for the on premises infrastructure another tool for your cloud infrastructure hope not multiple tools for multiple clouds you you don't have a unified view of of all your resources and the security and compliance challenges and so your task as a, as a CISO or, or IT manager becomes uh, very hard because you have a fragmented view. So hence the need for a unified console that can bring together all these issues into one single pane of glass view. That, uh, that becomes very important. Okay, I believe this is it, Anupam. And okay. yeah. <laughs> all right, so, so um, in closing, what I would say is the following. So clearly, hopefully, one of the things that I want to establish today, as I said, it's a very broad topic. I brought up a number of issues that could be a separate webinar topic. And the objective today was to get you a flavor of the issues in the land of security, in the land of cybersecurity assurance. And um, I want to reemphasize that clearly cyber attacks are not going away. 
and and there is a need to have a methodical way of addressing this which means understanding where you stand today by doing a security risk analysis and then adopting a multi stage approach to solving your in uh, solving your security assurance issues uh, having a multi stage program means uh, including monitoring and remediation along with uh, uh, protection and de detection is very key and you could uh, potentially leverage can you go to deal with your cyber security assurance needs uh, here are some examples of references that you will find um, the data that i've i've quoted below uh, in my in my slides and um, you know feel free to ask for a copy of the slides we'll be happy to share it with you but if you want to dive a bit deeper into any of the topics that i mentioned uh, along with some industry reports here are some references and uh, well we thank you for for your time if you need any further information about uh, this topic or about spanigo feel free to reach out um, to either directly me or uh to info at spanugo.io and we'll be happy to to follow up with you and answer any questions that you might have okay perfect thanks thanks anup and thank you all for attending and joining us and stay tuned for the another one thank you thank you everybody bye -bye. have a great day okay very bye bye